Let's dive into our message today. We are uh, really right on the cusp of the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, if you were interested just in the timing of it, uh, by Tuesday, the 11th, and then towards Thursday, the 13th, will be sort of the official dates. But you know, uh, different parts of the body of Christ celebrate these feasts and holidays on different days. And so uh, that's why at Global Truth, we've always been more concerned with the season that we're in, and particularly in that season, uh, getting a good sense of what is Lord trying to tell us, particularly as it concerns the feast in those seasons. And where we've been at for the last few weeks is this notion of the sweet spot, um, identifying this uh, convergence, if you will, in terms of how the Holy Spirit operates. And so we'll, we'll review that a little bit just to bring up to speed if you haven't caught the last couple of messages, and then we'll uh, bring it home in terms of uh, talking about the final element of this. Uh, the concept of this sweet spot, uh, again, is really important uh, in terms of just appreciating, again, the particular thing that the Lord has given us uh, at this particular time. Uh, during the feast, we always get some uh, point of emphasis and it's around this notion of getting a better sense of what the Holy Spirit is doing and how to work together. Uh, just for the understanding again of the logistics of this, we just came out of uh, 40 some days ago, uh, the Feast of, uh, of Unleavened Bread, uh, it incorporated uh, our Passover Seder, recognizing and drawing revelation out of those events uh, leading up to the death of Jesus on the cross, uh, his burial, uh, and then his resurrection. And of course, we just saw so many things that, uh, for a lot of us, those pictures, those dynamic pictures, just reinforce our sense of what salvation means to us as New Testament believers. Uh, Pentecost is from the Greek word for 50. And so what happens essentially is after that feast of first fruits, uh, again, the time where the high priest in uh, ancient Israel would go and pick the first right, shoot of barley out of the ground, wave it before the Lord, symbolic of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And from that point of the resurrection, they would actually count 50 days until they reach the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, it's one of those holidays that we have a better grasp of, you know, because we do uh, see clearly in the scripture, the celebration of Pentecost in Acts chapter two, an incredible experience at a point in time uh, where uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit comes and God establishes his body in such incredible form. It really is the beginning of the church in so many respects in terms of recognizing uh, God's promise. What's so important uh, for us in this season, um, particularly with this message of the sweet spot, uh, the Lord has really impressed on my heart in the uh, uh, times that I'm sharing with you on this, is to gain some insight in terms of what the Holy Spirit is doing so that we do a bit to lift the load. It just sort of seems... Uh, as New Testament believers, that a lot of our tradition, again, no criticism of our ancestors and forebears, uh, they were passing along what they knew. But as we get more uh, refined in terms of our identification of what actually happened, as we uncover, you know, some of the depth of what the scripture says, we find out that a lot of things just don't line up. And certainly one of those is there's such a, in our tradition, such a, a, a focus on our behavior and what we need to do and making the effort. Now, clearly, as we talk about, uh, once we're saved and once we understand the Lord's purpose in us, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. But at no point in time ever, 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 ever are we working to get God's love, his acceptance, his forgiveness, all the giftings of God come in our salvation. Uh, and if there's work that we do, uh, it's the work of communicating what God has done in our lives and advancing the kingdom. And so when we don't appreciate the function of that kind of grace, uh, walking in the kingdom can be a burden. And in my 40 some years of being in the kingdom, whenever I see myself uh, falling into a, a state of weariness, Whenever I feel like I'm really working hard at things that should come naturally, that tells me I really need to back up and refocus. Uh, Jesus made it very clear to us, right? And in this uh, time of Pentecost this year, that core message for us is to get to that place and stay there where that yoke continues to be easy and that burden continues to be light. And again, um, if that isn't something that we can accomplish, then I'm not really sure personally uh, that I've done what the Lord has given me to do. So far, it sounds pretty good. A lot of the feedback that we've been getting uh, is opening eyes and light bulbs are going off and burdens are just being dropped and let go. And again, that's what it's all about in this particular season. Um, so again, the concept of the sweet spot um, is it just my own understanding of how the Lord has been working and what the Lord has been doing in, in my life. I feel like uh, my ability, again, to understand what the Holy Spirit is doing 
does a couple of things. One, it enhances my perception of what co-laboring is actually about. What part do I play? What role do I play? It has also been just incredibly helpful in understanding and having a better sense of what I'm going through and what I'm dealing with, appreciating that the Lord has a very consistent purpose in this. And so I've just tried to identify in this sweet spot framework, just a few things uh, that I hope you can take on your own, put it to prayer, uh, sit with the Holy Spirit and listen. And if it's helpful to you in terms of getting a better sense of how the Spirit of God is working in your life, then again, uh, that's what it's all about. The particular things that have uh, focused in my life is firstly, this incredible gift, I'm gonna call it, that we're given in Romans chapter seven. It can be so incredibly freeing when we really recognize that God is more concerned about our focus on his righteousness than a focus on our shortcomings. It doesn't mean that aren't being taken care of. The Holy Ghost is at work in terms of bringing us to a place where the internal reality of our salvation absolutely is manifesting itself in the kinds of behaviors and the kind of conduct. We'll actually come full circle and make another point around that. Uh, the second is this idea of the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Whatever I'm doing, you know, I I want to make sure that I understand that I am aligned as the Holy Spirit was with Jesus, as Jesus was with the Father, in terms of what is it that God is doing. That's something I, I don't think, personally, I, I ever get to the point of complete and total clarity. But one of the things we emphasize is just appreciating that if we're kind of anywhere near that place, right, uh, the good and the acceptable will of God are not stages in our ability to do the will of God. They're basically three equal descriptors of what the will of God is about. And understanding those descriptors is helpful, at least for me, in terms of discerning. When something comes my way, how do I get a better handle on is it or is it not the will of God? Uh, the third thing which we'll talk about today is this idea of participating and that which is holy. I'll reiterate this point a couple of times, right? But this is one of those words that has so many depths and layers and complexity to it that it, it is kind of mind-boggling. But at the same time, I'm going to seriously encourage you that this is one of those words that you would need to at least get an emotional sense of what God is saying because it's incredibly profound and it has everything to do, at least for me, in terms of being able to navigate the reality of this realm at the same time, stay connected in those heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so where these things merge, right, where I feel the center point is, uh, is in fact uh, that sweet spot. Uh, and so as we addressed this again last time, as I mentioned, we talked about that good and that perfect, perfect good and acceptable rather, and perfect will of God. And today uh, we'll start to talk more specifically um, as we addressed the will of God last time uh, in terms of uh, removing some of that confusion. Uh, we talked about, again, the importance of recognizing that generally there are two things that happen in my mind with the will of God. One, hopefully recognizing that unbeknownst to myself, I'm generally, if I'm being led and guided by the Holy Spirit, as the passages in the New Testament tell us, then I have to make some assumptions that even though it may not be clear to me, the, the Holy Spirit is still leading and guiding me uh, because I'm not offering any particular resistance outside of what Romans 7 talks about. And so it occurs to me that maybe, just maybe, food for thought, that we're actually doing the will of God more regularly, more frequently than we might think. And for me, again, that takes an incredible amount of burden off. Uh, the other uh, option, the other factor, the other issue to consider is that I think we have a tendency, again, I know I do, when I really don't want to do what God wants me to do, that's kind of a difficult thing to deal with. It, it seems almost irreverent, right, that I would reject, refuse, deny, uh, not want to pay attention and throw my whole heart into whatever God wants. The reality is that as human beings, it takes a minute. Uh, and this is where Gethsemane comes into the picture. Uh, firstly, just as Jesus did, again, and read the story there for, for what it says, Jesus is contemplating the reality of dying on a cross. And he goes to Gethsemane and he basically says, is there another way? If so, I'll take it. If not, though, I'm here to do your will. And I think if Jesus can be that candid in his humanity, so can we. And what happens is, of course, transformative. When we're honest with God and we go to Gethsemane and we ask the Lord to cause us to want what he wants, uh, in so many instances, what I've experienced is the same thing Jesus did. My heart, 
my heart gets inclined and directed towards wanting to do what it is that God wants. And so um, hopefully this is uh, the kind of insight that does release some burdens. On one hand, uh, maybe we're not uh, focusing so much on the detective work that I think I can get wrapped up in, and maybe you as well, in terms of really having to figure things out with incredible precision and maybe accepting the fact that I'm going with the flow without even knowing it in many cases. And secondly, as I said, being candid with the Lord in those difficult moments and those difficult times. Uh, and that was really, again, the core of what we addressed in terms of that. So what we'll talk about this morning uh, is the third element of my particular construct. And that, again, is the idea of participating in that um, which is holy. The concept here, just to create some backdrop, is to recognize, again, contrary to a lot of church tradition, we are made holy. Holy is not something you achieve. It's just like salvation. It's just like the Holy Spirit. It's the condition, the state that God, through Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, declares us to be in. We are in that state of holiness, uh, and it is something, again, that was decreed by what God has done. And, and right off the bat, again, that's a real important distinction uh, because, you know, I grew up uh, in, the, in the church atmosphere as a kid being told and perceiving that holiness was something I really, 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 really had to work for. Uh, and that it was mainly reflected in my behaviors. I did stuff that wasn't sinful and therefore was holy. Again, never, never confuse the fact that behaviors count. We simply, when we talk about this at Global Truth, we're talking about what's the order in which these things are dealt with and who actually is dealing with those behaviors. And of course it is the Holy Ghost. But the important thing to recognize again is that we are made holy. We don't achieve it through any particular things that we do. Um, holiness is, is an interesting concept because in so many cases, and I won't go through the details of this because it's a little bit grammatical, right? But in so many cases, when we read the scriptures and it talks about holy, we see holy as an adjective, a word describing something else where holiness itself is a noun. It's a state of being. It's a condition. And it can be a characteristic of people, places, and things. Uh, years ago, I combed through uh, Old and New Testament and found a list of something like 40 different things that the Lord described as, as things that were holy. They embodied this concept of holiness uh, and some of the depth of that. And so we'll, we'll think of holiness as things that have this special characteristic that God has ordained for it. The, the understanding of it is the knowledge of the holy. It's the knowledge of those things that which is holy, right, uh, is understanding. That scripture always stuck with me from the very first time I read it with, uh, you know, salvation and, and the Holy Spirit uh, uh, generated insight that the knowledge of that which is holy brings me to a better place of understanding. And so if you need kind of a foundational scripture for uh, practicing those things which are holy and being involved with those things, that's kind of where uh, I actually get that. The, the, the word, again, as I said, I told you I'd repeat it. Here we go. Um, it is probably, again, one of the most complex ideas in the Bible. Uh, but as I said, it's something you really need to grapple with because it is so core, right, to the nature of God. We God is holy. That's the one thing, you know, that we understand and know, even though we don't necessarily have clarity in terms of the meaning. And what we'll do today is really just go uh, the most basic sort of level of comprehension. I'll, I'll introduce you to the notion that there is another level, but I won't go in that today. It'll be really too much to lay on us at one time, uh, but we'll take this as increments and we can always come back later and address the more difficult concepts. From a scriptural standpoint, uh, you see a very, very clear connection between Old Testament concept and New Testament concept of holiness. This is true in a lot of instances, but not necessarily all, right? Because we understand that in the New Testament, some Old Testament realities are actually come through the cross and they're still there. Some Old Testament realities nailed to the cross and some go through a transformation, right? There are a lot of Old Testament scriptures that we quote that we'd have to really quote differently, like First Chronicles, right? If my people were called by my name, would humble themselves, on and on and on. Well, we're already pretty far down the road in terms of the application of that scripture. And so while certainly calling on the Lord is transformative, 
it's a little bit different than it is in, in Chronicles. And so that's an example of that. But we do see in this case, real consistency, at least in terms of the meaning. Uh, the Hebrew word you can find in a Strong's Concordance, uh, number 6942 in the Hebrew, it is the word kadosh. Very complex word, but again, keeping it simple, kadosh refers to something that is set apart for a unique purpose. And not only is the purpose unique, but the thing that is set aside is uniquely fitted for that purpose. So it's the whole notion of being set aside. In the New Testament, we have the word hagias. Uh, that's in the, the Greek, uh, Psalms number 40, if you wanna look that up. Hagias means essentially the same thing. It's the word sanctified. Sanctified is a synonym an exact duplicate and replacement for this notion of holiness in terms of being set apart. Uh, I can just recall back in the day as a kid hearing people talk about being sanctified. And I had to assume that sanctification was some really, really, really advanced level of spiritual you know, growth or, or, or place in the spiritual realm. Uh, but it was really just the same word. Uh, and, and it was misused in quite a number of instances because it was, again, stuff we needed to do to be sanctified uh, or to act sanctified, recognizing all of these things, once again, are the byproduct of salvation made holy. Um, the other insight in Hagias that I think is fantastic is 99% uh, of the time in the New Testament, it's the word for saints. So a saint is essentially a holy one. Again, brings us full circle in terms of recognizing that this is something that is established by God. And so the whole concept of being set apart, right, is, um, is what we're, we are addressing. So let's dig into this a little bit more in terms of getting a sense of exactly what setting apart looks like, what's the connotation, and what is it uh, that the Holy Spirit is doing with our set apartness. So the, um, the other fantastic thing to appreciate about the Feast of the Lord is that they have a analogy in agriculture. Uh, in Unleavened Bread, we have a picture of the resurrection of Jesus, as I mentioned, as that first ripe shoot of barley being lifted up out of the, out of the ground and away before the high priest. When we get to Pentecost, we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the first fruits as well, but it's the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Uh, there's several different harvests of grain throughout the year, but this is the spring harvest. And there's roughly a, you know, a month and a half or so uh, gap uh, or more between the first ripe shoots of barley and the first ripe shoots of wheat. You see in that alone, this connection between death, burial, resurrection, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the, the thing I've always thought about is in terms of the differences between the barley and the wheat, what's the message there? And what you see in terms of, of, of culture, Mideastern culture, not just Hebrew culture, but the culture of that region, is that back in the day, barley, uh, a very bountiful crop, but the quality of the grain was a little bit less and maybe in some cases significantly less than the quality of wheat, which meant that barley was much less expensive. And so barley ends up being the bread uh, that is eaten by the people of lesser means, and wheat is a better bread. It's a more expensive grain and produces a more expensive bread and maybe a better bread. We could go off on a tangent right here, no doubt about it. We could talk, be talking about bread because Jesus says he is, of course, the bread of life. But we get this, again, picture of the uh, harvest of barley at the unleavened bread uh, feast of the Lord, and then 50 days later, the harvest of wheat. Appreciate that uh, this provides us with a really good starting point because just as in unleavened bread, we have the picture of the lamb and Egypt and the Passover to kind of dramatize this. We also have a really interesting picture in terms of the way the wheat and or the barley, but, but in this case, we're focusing on wheat, how it's actually turned into food. What's the process that wheat, again, or barley, really any grain uh, in this particular part of the world goes through, and it's a step process. Again, open up your spiritual eyes and ears. We're going to talk about the natural process, but hopefully you'll see the depth of the spiritual meaning that's coming out of that. Uh, and so in order to get um, the, uh, the wheat ready, it has to be threshed. 
If you read uh, the story of Boaz and in, in, in the book of Ruth, uh, there are lots of references all throughout the New Testament and, and obviously plenty in the Old in terms of the threshing, right? It talks about the threshing floor. Um, there's one of the Proverbs, I believe, that says uh, to muzzle not the ox who threshes out the wheat. Lots of different ways that they, they would get the kernels ready to go through the next phases of its processing. One of those, again, was just to take a stick and beat it. In some cases, letting the uh, the large animals tread on it, kind of like you would turn grapes into wine juice or how the olive press would squeeze the olives for that uh, olive oil to come out. Um, and so the first thing that happens is that the wheat is threshed. It's beaten to break up the kernels. And so if you, if you lack a grace of God mentality, the first thing your mind tells you is, okay, first thing the Holy Ghost is going to do is beat me. <laughs> you know, just you know, our performance-oriented brains can't help go there. The threshing was, in fact, necessary. But of course, who took the beating? Jesus was scourged. Uh, he was beaten with a really cruel instrument, his back ripped to shreds, uh, for uh, the Bible tells us all our iniquities were laid upon him. And so, yes, in terms of the process, just like in unleavened bread, the Passover, a death has to take place. But that death was the death of the lamb, the blood of the lamb signifying that. And here in the Feast of Pentecost, the grain is broken into pieces. Uh, but once again, Jesus uh, is the one who took the beating, if you will, to make the kernels ready for harvest. And so keep that in your mind, because again, all of these things speak so much and so deeply. And to me, such powerful pictures of the grace and mercy and power of God. Now, then the, uh, the grain is winnowed. This is just a fancy term for actually throwing it up in the air. And so because of the composition of the different parts of the, of the wheat, uh, uh, of the grain, um, some parts are lighter than others. And when the wind blows, the lighter parts, the chaff is going to get blown away. And then the grain and even the seeds fall back to the ground able to be used. It's, we're letting the flow of the wind start to hear things from the Spirit right now. We're letting the wind that's blowing carry away that which is useless so that which is valuable and can be turned into food, as in one instance, falls to the ground. And so it's a very, very clear process. You, you've run across this before. Uh, when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming, of course, to the Jordan, uh, he certainly says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, it, and it's hard to tell, is this an immediate thing that John says or not? But then he says, he's describing, you know, the bridegroom and the bride, uh, who Jesus is, uh, the, and he's the bridegroom. Uh, Jesus is the, is, the, is the bride, the groom. Um, and he says, Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his sweet into the garner, the bin, but, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And so a fan is just another um, uh, tool. You can see the picture of the woman who's carrying on her head uh, a winnowing fan. And so she's got grain in it. She's going to throw it up in the air. The wind is going to come blue and do his job. So again, we've run across uh, these insights before. And as you can see, it's very core concept uh, in our New Testament effort. And so, again, the wind is being used as the method of separating the grain. Uh, first, the wind blows through, and the seeds, again, which are probably per, per square millimeter, are heavier even than the grain. The seeds are critical because it's the seeds from this harvest that gets planted in the next. I know you're hearing the scripture, unless a corn of wheat fall to the ground, nothing happens, right? And so the wind is, uh, is separating firstly as it blows through. The seed is falling to the ground. I know it pictures the grain lying there first, but I think they did the picture this way because if you put the seed down first, put the grain on top of it, you couldn't see it. But the seed will be, will be the first to fall because of its heaviness. And then as the wind continues to blow, the chaff is blown away. Uh, the chaff is, um, is the lightest part because it's the least useful uh, and it simply gets blown away. The chaff is indigestible, as I understand. Uh, there's no value nutritionally or otherwise, and so it, it ends up being useless. That's why you'll always see passages and hear passages, both Old and New Testament, that talk about burning up the chaff, only because it's value. It's not talking about 
uh, punishment so much as the purification. Every time we hear the Lord talk about fire, 99% of the time, it's the purifying process. Sounds painful, but not really intended to evoke that message at all cases. Uh, but the useless things end up being burnt because they produce heat. That's about all that that helps, right? The um, when we when we kind of apply this concept of the ch of chaff in our lives, there are going to be a number of things that you could think about, and I can just enumerate right off the top of my head a bunch of those. Um, there is in the scripture, uh, especially in Jeremiah and several of the other Old Testament prophets, that essentially talk about chaff in the form of uh, unorthodox, not correct uh, doctrine, false doctrine, false teachers, as in this passage, unfaithful prophets. Jeremiah, um, here in verse 25, these unfaithful prophets claim that I have given them a dream or vision, and then they tell lies in my name. But everything they say comes from their own twisted minds. How long can this go on? They tell each other of their dreams and try to get my people to reject me just as their ancestors left me and worship Baal. Their dreams and my truth are as different as chaff and wheat. And so I think one of the, the, the important things about this particular definition is that uh, in this season of Pentecost, right, where the Lord is removing burdens, a lot of those burdens are the incorrect doctrines, the things we were told, all the things that I mentioned at the onset. Uh, and those things need to be corrected in our lives. And it's an ongoing process. Um, one of the things that's so difficult, I think, in the growth process when you know the Lord is you, you don't want to ever get 100% completely and totally comfortable on some of the peripheral issues in the faith. Now, there's certain things that, that are rock steady, right? Jesus is a son of God. His death was uh, was in the eradication of the sin nature and reconciled all people to God. There are four or five things that once you understand them, they really don't go any deeper because they are clearly foundational. But as we, as we think about the other aspects of the faith, it's just a long, long, long list of things that we don't have enough context for. And one of the most dangerous things I think we can do is just to decide what something means because it's so uncomfortable to be in that place of limbo. Uh, and I would certainly encourage you to think more about the benefit of being in that place of limbo because it keeps us continually growing. I think once we settle on what we think we know, uh, we position ourselves in a great difficulty. When I look across the body of Christ and I see the over 90,000 denominations and there's diversity, which is a good thing, but that diversity is not coming back together whole. That diversity in the body of Christ has been created over centuries and millennia by conflicts. So we can't agree on this. We can't agree on that. Let's go our separate ways. That's not diversity, right? That's destruction. That's chaos. That's rebellion against the concept that there's only one body. And somehow, you know, I'm, I'm, I have complete faith. Uh, I don't know how it could happen, but I have complete faith that the Lord is bringing this body of Christ together so that the things that we agree on, we agree on, and the things that we don't, we learn together. Why can't we just learn together? Amen. So Jeremiah, again, is equating uh, the chaff in this case to the wheat uh, in terms of the truth of the Lord and all these other things that get thrown at us. Uh, and so that's a, the uh, element of chaff. And then finally, uh, the grain itself uh, falls to the ground and becomes useful uh, to us in terms of making the bread. And so we think about those things in our lives. The analogy, I think, is pretty simple, uh, uh, perfectly suited for Pentecost. The wind is the breath of God, the Holy Spirit. There, there are a couple of great translations, mainly going more directly from the Aramaic language into the English, that, that when it talks about Holy Spirit, the term is spirit wind. Jesus said the same thing. He said, you know, you know the wind is there, you don't know where it came from. You don't know where it's going, but you know it's there. And he made reference to the Holy Spirit in terms of wind. And so this is a common concept. The whole notion of spirit, the word spirit, Old and New Testament, simply means breath. When uh, God breathed into the Adam, he breathed his life into him, his spirit. And man became a living soul. Um, so this is clearly 
uh, from what I can see in terms of the language as well as the, as the concepts and scriptures that wind is that Holy Spirit. And it, it helps me understand that whether it's comfortable or not, the reality is that the Holy Spirit is blowing through my life and removing the chaff. And the product of my efforts, the grain is going to fall to the ground to be used. And then there's seed to be planted. So the crop increases. And, and if I understand this now, then it just helps me evaluate some of the things that happen in my life, some of the places the Lord sends me, some of the things he asks me to do, because it's all about getting to that place uh, where the vessel is as primed and ready to go. And all the distractions, those sins that so easily beset us end up not uh, getting in the, in the way. Um, I, I could say this personally with confidence. Again, others have a different opinion. The, the Lord's concern, even with my sin, has more to do with the fact that it inhibits the flow of his purpose in my life than anything else. The behavior, not good, but the Holy Ghost is taking care of that. The problem with sinful behaviors is it becomes an impediment and an obstacle uh, to what the Lord wants us to do because we stay so focused on needs that he should be uh, uh, taking care of for us or wrapped up in guilt and condemnation and shame because we didn't live up to the mark. So again, all these things I think are so important. If we keep our eyes focused on the fact that the Lord has called us, again, as I say all the time, to work together with him to complete his plan of redemption of all created things from the bondage of sin that was imposed upon it for purpose. It's a mouthful, but it's tying together some of the things I think that you surface, particularly, you know, when you read, uh, read the book of Romans. And so um, I like to think of the Holy Spirit as gentle and forceful at the same time. Um, the Holy Spirit is not trying to uh, cause us to have accidents or get cancer or, or anything like that, but the Holy Ghost is serious about the work that is being done. And so while, yeah, there's a gentleness to the work of the Holy Spirit, it's serious. And really in this season, uh, one of the most serious things is making sure that we are ready and willing to do the will of God. That's what hurts, right? That's what hurt Jesus. It stressed him out so much that he uh, had a, uh, a, 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 a side effect where his sweat actually had the characteristic of blood. Hematocridosis, I think is the technical name for sweating blood, which apparently can actually happen. So uh, this is critical. Those purposes, again, that God has for us are purposes for which we have been set aside, which actually, again, means that we have been made holy. And so as we look at this notion of participating in that which is holy, it is primarily and initially the recognition of God having set us aside as special people for a special purpose. Peter call, talks about the church, a royal priest of the holy nation, a peculiar people. That word does not mean you're strange. For me, it applies just as well, right? But peculiar means of great value. We get the term pecuniary uh, in our, our, our language from something that has, has value. And so this is all that process of being made holy. Um, so as I mentioned at the onset, we touch on at least uh, as we wrap up here on another level of meaning. There is so much depth to this concept of holy. Let me tell you what that, that other meaning is, and I'll at least give you a description of it, and maybe at some point we can come back and dig into it because it, it is a little more complex. Not complicated. It's not hard to understand. It's just has levels of insight, and we're dealing with the, the concept of being in a different realm. The, the other level of meaning has to do with the concept of holiness being the character of God. And one of those characteristics of God is that he has this unbelievable capacity to be in the heavenly realm and also the capacity to dwell inside the heart of a human being. And he doesn't leave one place to go to another. He's always in both places at, at the same time. This capacity was given to Jesus and here it's coming, right? Jesus has given us that capacity because we have been made holy. And so you can understand this in a, in a few places in the scripture. Going back to the Old Testament, here's a really great picture. Uh, Jacob uh, has this dream and he sees a ladder. 
And on the latter, angelic hosts are going from the earth realm into the spiritual realm, while others are coming out of the spiritual realm into the earth realm. And so the angels are ascending and descending from one realm to another, from the heavenly realm to the earthly realm. When we pray, uh, as, the, uh, as what we know as the Lord's Prayer talks about, it says, pray that those things which already exist in the heavenly realm, that they manifest themselves in the earth realm. That which exists in the heavenly realm comes into this realm. When Moses was given the instructions for the tabernacle, I mentioned this briefly last week, he was told to build the one on earth according to the pattern of the one that Jesus showed him that apparently actually existed in the heavenly realm. So this is not a foreign concept. It's just difficult to appreciate because, you know, if you're like me, I'm barely aware of my existence in this realm. Right? I've been grappling with that for an awful long time, right? But to think that at the same time, I'm also in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, it's, it's just mind boggling. And so this is that other dimension, this other level of meaning, right? And so in other words, those angels that Jacob saw had the capacity to be in two places at one time, not contradicting each other, but in the spiritual realm and at the same time manifesting themselves in the earth realm. This has tremendous implications for how we see the depth of our salvation, for me, it has tremendous implications in terms of how I do life, how I recognize that even though I'm stuck in the middle of a lot of nonsense from time to time, at the same time, my capacity to deal with the nonsense is supported by the fact that I'm actually also in the heavenly realm, if you will, looking down at the situation. I'm removed from it in a, into a certain extent. To me, if the only impact of understanding this is just emotional, that's a whole big benefit. I mean, I think we can really incorporate this these spiritual things into you know, our understanding. But even if we don't, even if it's just an emotional reaction to the fact that I'm actually above all this at the same time, I am sitting in the, in the middle of the Godhead with Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and I'm not trapped in the circumstance. Just that notion by itself without any other spiritual connotation uh, changes perhaps the way you look at circumstances and the way you look at situations. Uh, we see this all throughout. And I'll just end by showing you a few places uh, for your further study. John 17, you know, great passage. Uh, Jesus essentially uh, is praying for the disciples because he knows he's leaving. He's explained that to them. They're at various stages and agreeing uh, degrees of comprehending that. Uh, they're, they're, they're about to see him walk through walls and all kinds of stuff and raised from the dead. So they're at the beginning of the revelation. But he basically prays for them, right? And he says... I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. Don't take them out of the world. We're going to stay right in it. But thou should keep them from the evil. In that case, it's actually the evil one. So keep them in the middle of the circumstance because they're here to do a job and protect them that the evil one is not able to disrupt what God is doing with them. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them. Make them holy through the, through thy truth. Your word is truth. It's the word of God that made us holy. God declared and decreed that we would be made holy. And so you hear Jesus essentially uh, telling them, uh, praying to the, that the Lord would make them holy through truth because they're in the world. At the same time, they don't belong to the world. Not They're not of the world. Another place you see this is Peter. Uh, Peter essentially says the same thing from a different point of view. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Conversation is a Elizabethan King James era word, which simply means conduct, right? So since he's called you to be holy, act holy. So here again, understandable uh, that our, our ancestors, forebears, got a little bit confused because the acting holy here, he's not talking about, you know, whether you smoke or drink and all those are dumb things to do. Of course, they, 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 they hurt us, right? He's talking about our spiritual conduct. That when we come into a situation, we're not overwhelmed by what we see, but because we are holy, we recognize that there's a power outside of this realm that can enter this realm and change 
the natural circumstance. Could go on and on and on about that, but I hope that that point uh, hits home to you. Peter then says, and, and hopefully this will clarify this, Peter says, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. So the Lord told the children of Israel and passed that message along to us through Jesus that he's holy, we should be holy too. And again, if our definition and our understanding is in purely the natural realm, we're like, that's impossible. There's no way I can act like God. Well, you can act like God in the sense of recognizing that you are functioning in both places at the same time, like God. There's lots of different ways the scripture talks about us being like God. Um, we're never God. It never, ne don't get that thought part twisted. But we have been made, right, <laughs> in the image and the likeness of God. And it takes some discernment sometimes to understand exactly what uh, image and likeness is referring to in different settings, right? So uh, we are to act according to this capacity to exist in both realms. Once again, even if you don't grasp the, the depth of this in terms of spiritual insight, acting according to our holiness is the same as uh, with someone close to you when they say something that you don't like or uh, they do something that you don't like resisting the temptation to let your survival instincts kick in and say something that they won't like. Holiness, because I'm holy, I have the capacity not to stay in that place of offense, but immediately recognize I'm in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus. And because of that, I don't have to rely on my survival instinct. I don't have to respond in a negative, ugly way. You know, I can count to 10 with me. If I can count to three, I'm lucky, but I can count <laughs> and have my conduct be holy. I can act like God. I can offer forgiveness. I can offer grace. At a minimum, I cannot say anything. And so again, we can take this to a very sophisticated level of application or just think about the basic ways in which we can demonstrate uh, this level of holiness. And finally, uh, Paul tells us, about our, our, our dual citizenship, if you will. Even when we were dead in sins, God hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So raised from the dead, quickened, and then made to sit in heavenly places. That's where we, uh, we develop that capacity in terms of being uh, people who are exhibiting God's holiness. So as I close here, no wonder, uh, as it says, do we struggle as human, with our human nature. You know, as believers, I think we start to recognize that a lot of the struggle is because we're like in two places at once. And face it, folks, who else on the planet is comprehending and dealing with the fact that they've been made holy and they are seated in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, and at the same time, in the middle of difficulties and circumstances. Amen? So with that, uh, I will bring it to a close, and I'll open it up for any questions, any comments, any other insights.